Hi. I'm just going to wait a minute before I start to uh, let some people get online. Um, today I'm going to talk about my journey um, and it's not been an easy one and this for me is very difficult. Now, you can start in 2008 when um, it was a normal day. I basically was looking after my mum and she had got PSP, which is progressive supernuclear palsy. So I gave up working full time and lived with my parents to help my mum. She kept falling over. This was very early stages, um, but to cut a long story short, I lived with them for a couple of years and then I went and rented a bungalow. Um, so that my dad could drop my mum to me while he worked. Um, now I did this for two years and were, at the end of the two years I, I rented the bungalow. Um, was living there for two weeks and then uh, I knew something was wrong with the electric, something was up, so I got an electrician in the electrician um, checked and said that none of the electrics were earthed. So I had to get hold of the landlord and she voided my tenancy. The next day, I dropped Zach to school. Now, just a little bit about Zach. <clears throat> Zach was five, nearly five and a half. Um, he had a photographic memory. I'd been teaching him pigeon French since the age of two. So he was he was a bright spark. Um, knew every car that there was back until the early 19th century. Could name every planet in the solar system. And just was an amazingly intelligent child. Um, I have two other children, Danny, who's 25, and Tani, who's 22, and two lovely grandchildren, one of nearly five years old and a, a baby of five months, and I adore all my children and my grandchildren. Um, getting back to what I was saying, so um, basically, I, I, Zach was really good at football. Uh, he was being scouted by a private club, and um, he was playing for a private team at the time. I dropped him to school, he went to Broadfields and Edge, where probably a lot of you know that school. Um, so that's like primary. Um, and I was going off that day to go and find a property in St Albans because I decided I'd moved from St Albans to Edgeware to look after my mum and now that this property had been um, void, I was going to need another property. So I was up in St Albans going around the estate agents at the time and um, listing to look for a property up there. I was up there and it must have been about 2.30 in the afternoon and I came over feeling really confused, not knowing what was happening, just didn't, I actually didn't, I remember the feeling, it was like I didn't know where I was. It was like this confusion hit me and I, what was I doing here? I needed to go home. And so I jumped in my car and I'm driving back to Edgware um, because of, obviously we've got to move from Edgware now. Um, on my way, I think I was about five minutes from school when I get a call from the after school club um, saying that Zach was crying. And Zach was one of those kids, you know, he could take a knock and a bump and he would never cry. It had to be something really massive for Zach to cry. Anyway, the after school club put him on the phone to me and he said to me, Mommy, I'm scared. Mommy, I'm scared. Come and get me. And I just, my blood ran, ran cold at that point. I knew something was terribly wrong. And I just, I was only five minutes from the school, but you can imagine it felt like a lot longer. So I get to the school, I go into the school, to the after school club, and Zach is there and he sees me. He gets up from a seat and he's like this. And he looks like he's drunk. Um, and I, I say, Zach, Zach, you're right. Mummy, mummy, I'm scared. And he collapses in my arms. And I'm like, oh my God, what's going on? I don't know, no one's phoned me, no one's told me anything. Uh, the first thing I thought was maybe he's had a hit to the head, maybe he's concussed. I didn't know, I didn't know what had happened to him. Um, but he was unconscious at this point, And so I woke him up because I thought if he's concussed I've got to keep him awake okay because you just you don't know what's going on and I just went by my intuition and, and I was scared about it um, and I stood there and they said do, do, do you want to take him to the hospital and I went 
Yeah, and then I went, hold on a sec, no, I can't. I can't think straight, how can I drive? So they called an ambulance. At this point, Zakin is, is in and out of consciousness. He's, um, I'm doing everything to keep him awake. He's begging me to let him sleep. I can't let him sleep. Um, I think to myself, if he's concussed and he falls asleep, he might go into a coma, which is, you know, common knowledge. That's what happened. So keeping him awake was vital at that point. So anyway, the ambulance eventually turns up half an hour later and I get back into the ambulance and he, he's laying on, on the gurney and it, he doesn't look like anything's wrong. And the ambulance man said to me, oh, I found a bump. I went, oh, thought to myself, thank God he's hit, you know, it's a hit, but it, it, it bumps come out, so it's not so bad. Um, we get to Barnet General Hospital, and Zach seems, again, seems fine, he's he's talking to me. We get into uh, um, A&E, that's an emergency, and all of a sudden, bang, like that, he's out of it. I mean, he's just lost consciousness, he's laying there lifeless, and I, I, I've... I think, to be honest, you go into this uh, this kind of place within your own mind of, you know, I, I've got to deal with this now. I can't be emotional right now. I've got to really deal with this. So I did. And I remember there was this junior doctor trying to take blood from Zach and they couldn't find the vein. And I helped him find the vein. And so as he's taking blood, um, his sats are going down something's terribly wrong so they rush him in to have a cat scan he's unconscious he starts choking his dad had got to the hospital by this point and, and pulled a baby bell out of his throat um, the cat scan shows that Zach has a massive bleed on the left side of his brain it's called an extra hematoma um, and he's dying basically at this point and they're prepping him now Sorry if I'm disjointed, but it, it, it's this is the first time I've ever told my story publicly. Um, so anyway, so they're, they're prepping him. And I go over and I look at him. And as they're checking his eyes, I can see one pupil is small, one pupil is big. And that tells me that he's dying. And I say to them, can you get a helicopter? Can you fly us to Great Ormond Street? And they said, no. They said, we can't put him in the air. So then an ambulance takes us to Great Ormond Street Hospital. Now, all the way to the hospital, the ambulance lights are going, the noise, the sound, and Zach is laying on this gurney, lifeless, and the doctor's there just bagging him, all the way he's bagging him. And I'm sitting there very quietly because in my mind I'm talking to Zach. I'm, I've always been very close to my children, and I've always been able to have a, a form of telepathy with them. And I'm saying, hold on, baby, hold on, baby, in my head. And the doctor said to me, you're very quiet. I said, yes, but I'm, I'm talking to him in my head. And he said, OK. And we get to Great Ormond Street Hospital and they rush him into surgery. And the, and the doctors and the nurses are cuddling me that, are, you know, when I get there. And um, the doctor said to me, you know, don't try and be strong. And I said, look, just when you get him into the operation, please tell him that mummy's waiting for him. And that's what they did. The doctor came out and he said, I've told him all the way so I had to hand him over. He's in operation now. Anyway, minutes turned to hours, hours just went on and on and on. It must have been six or seven hours that they were operating him on. And I remember during this time I was in the waiting room on my own. Um, I'd separated from his dad four months earlier, so I had no one. My mum and dad were in Cyprus, thank you. My mum and dad were in Cyprus at the time, so... I had no one with me and, and I just remember this lady, she came out of nowhere. I was never able to find her again, a nurse. She came up to me and she said to me, can I do anything for you? And I said, can you just hug me? And she did. And I remember being in, in the waiting room on my own, no one there. I just felt that come out of his body. I'm a spiritual person. And I was going, get back into your body, get back into your body now, you know. And obviously it worked because a few hours later uh, we were taken up to the uh, paediatric intensive care unit. And I remember waiting and waiting, which seemed like hours for Zach to come up. And all of a sudden the lift doors open and there's this child in a bed with tubes coming out of 
him everywhere. I, I, I can't describe it to you. It was horrendous. Um, and I'm looking, and I look again, and I can see that's... It's Zach. And it, it's a shock. You can imagine as a parent, as a sister, as an aunt, as a mother, anybody out there that's got family. Um, it, it, that's my little boy laying there, you know? Anyway, we go into PICU, and they... they got him in Bay 13 and I'm thinking it's not unlucky because my mother, bless her, over Sholem was, was born on the 13th and maybe it's a sign, you know. Um, Dad calls me and says that they're trying to get a flight back to the UK. It, it ends up taking them five days. I phoned my brother Mark um, and he's on his way. Um, I think at this point just pure shock. I, I, I did an article for a magazine and if I can show you that was a week after the accident, but he was still attached to a tube and, and stuff like that. Um, and this was him before the accident playing football. So, you know, th this has gone from a, 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 a normal child to all of this happening within a day. And um, so we're in PICU and they said, you know, he died in the operation, but it, we got him back. And then they said, right, he's obviously under anaesthetic. He'll wake up in seven hours, and then we can see where we are. But but they said there's only a 1% one one chance he will survive. Um, I, at this point, I'm not a religious person, but I was praying. Um, I wouldn't leave him. I stayed with him. Um, I, I didn't know what to do. I was just looking at the monitors and everything else. Um... All of a sudden, seven hours later, the alarms go off. He dies. They, the nurses and doctors push us out into the corner and I was told later that I was screaming, if you die, I'll kill myself, which I think any mother would, any father, any, you know, you get it, guys. Um, but all of a sudden, I'm screaming at him and I'm not in the same room, but I can see across, because in, in Great Ormond Street, they've got like bridges that you have got glass windows and you can see straight into the PICU and I can, I can see the curtain of where he is and I, I'm willing him, willing him to not die on me. And all of a sudden, we get called back in. And the nurse said it was a miracle. His, his sats went to zero, he was dead um, for two minutes and he fought his way back before they had a chance to resuscitate him and they were saying he was a miracle so that became somewhat of a legend at Great Ormond Street Hospital. Um, they then realised when they got him stable that his brain had swollen. They then asked my permission to put a bolt in his head which basically is a very fine wire that goes into the brain that they can read from the machines better so they get a better idea of what his brain is actually doing. Six days he was in a chemically induced coma and for six days I did not leave his side. I sang to him, I, I talked to him, I told him I was there, that he should listen to my voice and find his way back from listening to me but I wasn't leaving him and I knew he was probably very scared and it was probably very dark but I was here to light the way. And on day six, nearly day seven, they woke him up. I was scared. <laughs> um, but I knew no matter what happened, I would stand there and I would be with him. Even if it was for the rest of my life that I had to look after him, I would do that because he is my child. And that's what mummies do. Um, but all I wanted was him back regardless of what state he was in because he is my baby. I'd be the same with any of my kids. But thank God... This didn't happen to the other two. This this was Zach, Zach's journey. Anyway, when he woke up, he was screaming. He couldn't move, he was paralyzed. He had paralysis. He, he couldn't lift his neck. He, he was like a newborn baby. Imagine a newborn baby like this, laying there, can't move your hands, can't move your neck, can't talk, just screaming. And so, I thought, what's the best way? Because obviously he's trying to communicate and he can't do it. So at the beginning, <coughs> he obviously stayed in the bed with all the tubes. He was being fed uh, through a tube because he couldn't, his palate didn't coordinate. He couldn't, his swallow was very weak. 
Um, so I had friends, a lady called Sandra, who was a friend of mine back then, who was a rock, and basically was with me the whole way through it. And we both were dance, dance, singing and acting teachers. We had clubs at the time. Um, and she came and helped me. And what we did with her daughter was we blew up a balloon one day. And the balloon would bounce and Zaki would go, uh, uh, like this because he couldn't really move or make noises. But he obviously liked it. And the balloon fell on his hand. And he went like this with one finger. And that was the start of getting Zach to move his hand. We went through intense physiotherapy, um, everything was intense. The OTs, the physiotherapies, the, the vocal coaches, everything. They were amazing. Um, we'd been at Great Ormond Street for about a month. Zach still couldn't walk, he, he, was, he couldn't use his legs. They got him a Zimmer frame, but he was finding it very, very hard. We then got transferred to um, Watford Hospital. And I'd, while I was at Great Ormond Street, I'd learned everything there was to know about how to feed through a tube, how to change him in the bed, how to look after him. They were what I would call the Rolls Royce of hospitals. They were amazing. The staff, the doctors, just everybody there was exceptional. Um, we went to Watford with Zach, um, and they, he had his own room to start with, and that was fine, but no nurse in that hospital, bar one, knew how to feed through the tube that Zach had because they dealt with babies but not toddlers. So I had to try and teach them. The first nurse that attempted it didn't kink the pipe and didn't the tube and did not warm the milk. And I said, what are you doing? And she said, feeding him. I said, you can't feed him like that. You'll cause air in his stomach. You'll cause and upset him in his stomach because it's cold. You've got to do it at body temperature. Oh, I didn't know. So I ended up doing all the feeds. I had to wait ages for them to bring the feeds and I didn't want to leave Zach, so it was very hard. I did shifts with, with his dad, so I would do the day shift, his dad would do the night shift. But after being in Watford for three days, they moved him to a bay with sick babies. Now at this point, you can imagine, Zach is open to any infection. And I tried to tell them, look, you can't put him in there because if he gets an infection, he could, you know, it could really affect him. But they were not interested. Their care was awful. They would sit at the desk talking among themselves and ignore people's needs. So on day six, they said we could take Zach home for a home visit. So we did. I took him home for a home visit and I never went back. Um, I took it all on myself um, as a single mum and did everything I could for Zach. The, the, services of the communities got involved but it took a month for them to actually start because what we didn't know was once we left the hospital we'd lost the intense care no one told us um so i then went on to do the intense care with zach until the services kicked in and they started helping now zach now we're talking eight years on um i've worked very hard very very hard with Zach to get him to where he is today he's walking he has cerebral palsy down both sides but his left side is the worst um, his brain damage is emotionally based which means that he can regress to a six-year-old if he gets upset so imagine for example you say to a toddler a toddler says to you mummy I want sweeties you say no what's gonna happen a toddler's gonna have a tantrum right that was Zach um, he's 13 now, and his emotional intelligence is of his age, but his, uh, sorry, his intellectual intelligence is his age of 13, but his emotional intelligence is still six, which means it's ongoing. Now, we fought for three years to get him into Tadworth, which is an amazing ABI centre in Surrey, um, and we got into that when he was eight years old, and they did observations, and they did... Um, uh, records to help people understand ABI. ABI isn't very well known. ABI meaning acquired brain injury is not well known out there in the world. I only wish it was. It comes under so many spectrums that they cannot label it. For example, autism, Asperger's, you name it. He sits on each and every one of them. So everybody out there that has a child with some kind of learning difficulty 
difficulty, whether it's ADHD, um, regardless of how small it is, my son has is on a spectrum of it. So trying to get help for him has been an absolute nightmare. Um, but working really hard, we got him into a primary school and it was very hard going. They didn't get it. A lot of people see ABI children as naughty. They don't understand that it's their condition. Um, if anybody wants to look it up, go to the website of CBIT, C-B-I-T, because that explains ABI. I would really like to get it out there and help other parents with children who have special needs of all types to know they're not alone. Um, but right now, we're fighting yet another battle. Zach got, got into mainstream school because intellectually, as I said, he's very able. Um, but over the last two years, they've learnt that they can't, have not got the resources to deal with his outbursts. If Zach gets upset, Zach has no process. If someone upsets you, you'll think, oh, silly person, or, or you'll think, you know, oh, I can't be bothered with that. And you'll walk away. Zach doesn't have that. Zach's response is to swear at you or to get angry with you, to hit out at you, or to walk out. For example, he walked out of class and went missing and they had to pull four teachers out of teaching to go look for him, which in a mainstream school is very, very difficult. And this has been going on for the last two years at Marlborough. They've done everything they can to help. Um, they've tried to learn as much as they can to help, but unfortunately, ABI, there's not enough information out there and there are definitely no schools that deal with ABI. So now, unfortunately, after a lot of talking, meetings and everything else, the schools have put their hands up and said that they can no longer um, have Zach at school. And we've been to CAMS and they've now said that he is um, not um, able to attend school due to his mental health problems. So now I have Zach at home 24 seven and I love him to bits, but boy, it is full on. Um, he's a clever little boy and I love him. I love him so much and he knows that but it's, it's not easy. So what I want you guys to know is that no matter what you go through in life as a parent, as a grandparent, sister or brother, you stand by and you fight the battles you need to fight. This is ongoing for me and it will be. I don't think it will change not in the next year, maybe not in the next 10 years, but I, I'm now trying to get Zach into a provision which is a therapeutic educational environment so that he has the ability to interact with others and, and try and learn social skills. Um, he loves football, but he doesn't, I've, I've had him join a disabled team, but he cannot see himself as disabled. He suffers terribly with depression, anxiety, and insecurities. And he's bored and he's lonely and sometimes he can be suicidal as a parent it is very hard to see your child go through these emotions and these feelings um and to be honest he has no friends because kids just don't understand him don't understand he, the way he reacts i mean it would come across to another child as as zach being bossy but you know zach is six socially so it's very very hard it's a lonely life for him and um, I just wanted to share my story with you all because I had to as a mum find something to do and work around Zach it's been really really hard I have my dogs and you've probably all seen my puppies um, and I love that but it doesn't pay the bills <laughs> um, <clears throat> so I met a lady um, because I, I hadn't lost any weight in the last five years. I, I seem to have put it on because I've been housebound with Zaki. That's Zaki's hand. He's listening. You want to say hi, Zach? No? Okay. Um, stop with the hand, Zaki. <laughs> um, so I met this lady and she said, oh, try this stuff, right? You can lose weight on this stuff. Stop. And you can lose weight on this stuff. And I did. And I have. And then I thought, you know what? maybe I can help other people like this lady help me to do something around a child because I know a lot of us out there struggle 
financially and struggle socially. And so I've joined um, a company called Juice Plus and um, that's it given me an interaction with people I've got a lot of friends requests now I speak to a lot of people I'm trying to help them I really want to help people you know if if we could have everything in life for free I'd still be be helping people (laughs) I think it's just my nature and also being you know spiritual I I feel I get a sense of achievement achievement out of helping people like I have my Zach and I just wanted to share my story with you um Yes, I know I put a lot of posts up about Juice Plus on, but I'm only trying to help people. Um, but if there's anybody out there that has a child with a, an acquired brain injury, I'd love to hear from you. Anybody out there that has a special needs child of any type, let's get talking. Let, let's help each other. It's a very lonely life being a mum of a special needs kid. So that's the story of Zach. I'd like him to say hello to you guys so you can see how wonderful and what a miracle he has become. Could you just say hi for me, please? Yeah. All right, what if I just turn the video around and you just say hi, please? Yeah. You don't want to? No. I tried, guys. He doesn't want to. I, but he did do a video for the Chewies on Juice Plus. It's on my site. Some days he'll do things, other days he won't. But um, today is one of those days he won't. Sorry. But hey, that, that's the story. The, the, other story. the other part of the story really is that my mum passed away six years ago um, and I miss her terribly. She was my rock. Um, we've had a lot of traumas. I suffer from PTSD, depression and anxiety. And I know a lot of people out there can relate to me with that. Um, I'm basically just reaching out. This is a really big step for me. I'm very nervous about doing this. Um, but I can see there's quite a few people listening and I just really wanted to share with you and thank you so much for participating in this video. And guys, please message me. I like nothing more than hearing from people and chatting. It, it, it you know, it makes my life a little bit more interesting than being stuck at home. Thank God I've got a, a lovely boyfriend. He He's amazing. Um, and he helps all of us. I, I can't express to him my gratitude, but I really am. I'm grateful to my daughter, Tanya. She's so supportive. She's amazing. Um, my son, Zach, even though he's the victim and all of this, he's amazing. He does make me laugh. I love him to bits. To my dad, who tries to be there, but can't always bless him. He's, he's struggling at the moment from cancer, but I'm, I pray now that they've taken the growth out that he's going to get better and stronger because he's a Harris Um, and really all the people that have been in my life that have helped me I just want to say thank you Um, and all of the people that are friending me and chatting to me and giving me advice and my team at Juice Plus who um, are there trying to help me too I'm trying to make it guys I want to be successful because the main reason for me wanting to be successful in life is to make sure that Zach has one when I'm not here. So, you know, just like my posts and, you know, if you're interested in getting healthy, losing weight, come join me at Juice Plus. You know, it's it's great stuff. It does work. But thank you again, everybody. And I love you all for listening to me hobbling on and telling you everything. But just to finish... Here's a picture of all my children back then with me when the accident, that was before the accident, okay? And this is a picture of me and Zaki a year after the accident. He is amazing. I'm humbled by him, I really am. If you've just tuned in, then please watch the video. Um, If anybody, it's touched anybody, let me know. I'd love that. And in the meantime, I just wish you all a great day. And thank you for listening. God bless you all.